I looked in to make sure that I pushed the button. So yes, Kevin, I pushed the button. All right, uh, I'm JD, in case you don't know me, and I don't see many familiar faces here, so that's good. Uh, I'm here to start a conversation, and for many of us, it won't be comfortable, but I really hope it resonates with at least some of you. Either way, I want to get you talking. Uh, you may be asking yourself, who is this random guy standing up in front of you? Well, I've been a Drupal and PHP developer for about six years. Uh, I've been doing HTML off and on since the 90s. Uh, my first programming experience was, are any of you familiar with the old magazine or TV show 321 Contact? No. It, it, it was great, but it, the magazine in the back of it, they used to print out basic code. So you would have to take it from the printout and enter it into, I was using QBasic, so it mostly worked, but uh, take that and hope that you didn't have any typos, and it was nice intro to debugging. I am also a mid-camp Chicago organizer, which is you know, the, the Midwest area Drupal camp, very similar to this one. Uh, I'll also help organize the Drupal Chicago meetup, and before I got into all this, I was a paramedic and a firefighter for quite a while. Also, I have my own mental illnesses, um, and my goal today is to talk with you about mental illness and tech. So I want to thank you all for being here, for taking part in this conversation, and if you were expecting a Flanders cosplay conference that's on the third floor. <laughs> It's a Ned Camp joke. I'm making them all weekend. <laughs> uh, I'm Drupal Technical Architect at Genuine. We're a full service shop out of Boston with an office in Chicago. That's the one that I work out of. If you want to tweet about this, go ahead and use my, my Twitter handle there, JD Does Dev. Uh, if you're on any of the Slacks, you can find me at Dorf. Um, also use the hashtags NedCamp18 and Osmi. Are you familiar with Osmi at all? Or? Yeah, question already? Yeah, just from the Slack door. Do you play Dwarf Fortress? No, I. it's from World of Warcraft. Oh. Uh, I was Dwarf the Dwarf for okay. a very long time. I have overcome that addiction and uh, live a happier life now. So if you haven't heard, uh, heard of Osmi, I will be talking about them in a little bit. Uh, some disclaimers I give every time I give this talk is I am not a mental mental health professional nor am I a medical professional. I'm not here to give medical advice. I'm somebody with mental illnesses, plural, and I'm here to talk to us about us. Um, I've experienced difficulties in the workplace and in my personal life because of mental illnesses, and I was in a in denial for a very very long time. Also, I tend to swear without thinking about it, so I want to apologize ahead of time. Uh, so, sorry about that. There are a couple reasons that I do this talk, and I've been doing it for a little while now. Uh, if there was one sentence for what I wanted to accomplish while doing this talk, it's that I want to start the conversation. That's because people don't want to talk about mental illness. It's kind of swept under the rug. It's you know, you know something we just don't mention. Uh, lately, it's been getting a lot more good press, I guess would be the word for it, to where people are opening up, celebrities are opening up, uh, and, and shining light on it in a, in a positive manner. So, so that's good. Hopefully I won't have to do this talk for, for much longer. Um, I'm also going to share some resources and statistics that uh, have come from various sources and share some of my experiences, both personal and professional, both as a patient and as a caregiver well, from being on the ambulance. Uh, like I said, I was a paramedic for 10 years. I was an EMT and a firefighter before that. And I've seen firsthand, both as a caregiver and as a patient, what untreated mental illness can do. It's also kind of a big deal. It represents the biggest economic burden of any health issue in the world, costing 2.5 trillion, that's trillion with a T, dollars in 2010, and that number is only going up. But above all else, it needs to be talked about. The conversation needs to be started. The stigma around mental illness needs to be erased. And the first step is opening up the conversation. And again, you all are here. You're taking the right steps. Even if you don't have mental illnesses yourself, you're, you're, you're in the right place. And thank you for being here. So why should this be important to you? Why should you even care about this? Well, approximately 20% of adults in the US experience mental illness in a given year. 
that's one in five. That, that's a pretty high number. But we're going to find out later the number is much higher in the tech community. For me, as I mentioned, I have mental illness, plural. I suffered in silence, and for a very, very long time, I was in denial. I was afraid that admitting I had an illness would make it real, and I was also a victim of the stigma around mental illness. I thought only, uh, only crazy people had it, only damaged people had it. Uh, it. It meant that somebody was defective, and I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to be damaged. I didn't want to have that label on me. And I was worried that if I told people how I was feeling, that they would treat me differently. Um, but something I often need to tell myself is I'm not weak, I'm sick. I'm not defective or damaged, I have a disease. And that helps me get through a lot of days. So I've already started talking about myself quite a bit, but I want to find out a little bit more about all of you. So how many of you are developers or here to learn development, anything site building? Okay, quite a few. Anybody a uh, project manager, project owner, account manager, something not directly related to tech? How about HR? Anybody from HR? Good. Um, <laughs> are any of you in upper management, you know, managers, vice presidents, presidents, CEOs? Okay. So, big question, what is mental illness? Um, well, it's a very, very high level term for many, many uh, illnesses, many disabilities, many conditions. Uh, there is a book, and I really should catch up on this. I don't know what version they're on, but it's called the DSM. I think they're on five. They're on five? Okay. And it's about you know, from the floor up to here of just criteria for what constitutes a mental illness. Uh, saying, okay, well, if you have this for this amount of time along with this, then you have this. And there are very spe specific criteria to meet them. Um, according to the Mayo Clinic, though, it refers to a wide range of mental health conditions or disorders that affect your mood, thinking, and behavior, which can be a number of things. For me, though, I have major depression, I have anxiety, I have PTSD, and I have ADHD. Uh, so the, the definitions of those, clinical depression is a depressed mood most of the day with a loss of, loss of interest in normal activities and relationships every day for at least two weeks. That's the, that's the criteria definition of it. Anxiety is characterized by feelings of worry or fear that are strong enough to interfere with one's daily activities. PTSD is characterized by failure to recover after experiencing or witnessing a terrifying event. And ADHD is characterized by varying degrees of hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention that lead to difficulty in academic, emotional, and social functioning. Now, when I was a kid, because I was only recently diagnosed, maybe about six, seven months ago, I finally got the diagnosis of adult ADHD. Uh, when I was a kid, it was more, eh, he's, he's just a little bit strange. He just needs to burn off some energy. We need to find something. You know, don't worry about him. He'll, he'll be fine later. And it was just like today, it was kind of swept under the rug. For PTSD, that's, that's one that I really had a hard time grasping with, just figuring out what exactly that was, how, how did it, how that came to me, because immediately when you hear PTSD, usually your mind goes to veterans or people in the military, and it, it's not necessarily just them, although it does happen pretty often, but it can be anything. And the way that one psychologist described it to me that makes a lot of sense, especially working with computers, is think about your brain as a computer. It shouldn't be too far off, but you've got your RAM, which is really fast, really connected right to the CPU, got stuff going back and forth uh, almost immediately. And then you've got your hard disk, which takes a little bit of time to get into the RAM and then move it forward a little bit longer. So if your RAM is your short-term memory and your, your hard disk, your storage, is your long-term memory, and with PTSD, something gets stuck in the short-term memory, in the RAM. So it's easily accessible. Anything can, a sight, smell, sound, anything can just bring that right back to the front. It's as if you're reliving that moment over and over. Uh, and the best treatment for that is to find a way to move from the short-term memory into the long-term memory so it isn't so just ready to go. 
So I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that that really opened up my eyes to what how how it works and how it's affected. So I had this, all this. Like I said, I wasn't diagnosed with ADHD for until about six seven months ago. With everything else came uh, a few years ago, but you know. I went for a long time and not admitting anything was wrong. And then finally one day I accepted something was wrong. The first step was the hardest. I, I know that's you know pretty cliche, but it was the most difficult. I, I kind of had an epiphany where I saw other people, you know, all things being equal, I was not happy and they were. You know, we same income, same social situation, same pretty much everything. I just couldn't couldn't seem to bring myself out of. And I also noticed that people didn't get as upset or angry about small things as I did. And uh, people weren't affected by everyday things like I was. And I kind of had that, that epiphany that maybe everyone else wasn't the issue. Maybe it was me. You know, that, that situation where if everywhere you go smells like dog shit, look at your own shoe. Um, <laughs> And, and for a lot, a lot of people, this was the hardest part. So I took the next step, and I got treatment. When I say I got treatment, I, I mean I started seeing a therapist. Uh, I started taking medication. I am a huge proponent of better living through chemistry. I find creative outlets. I play Barry Sax in two community bands. Um, I'm active in the local Drupal community and the, the, the broader Drupal community. And I do stuff like this. I start the conversation up. Uh, in social events, I'm not shy about talking about it. You know, if somebody mentions something or if somebody asks me a question, I will gladly answer. I don't really need to go into the details of what caused my PTSD, which could have caused and other things, but I have it. And if other people are uncomfortable about talking about it with me or hearing about it, once I start talking, you know, that, that's kind of on them and it's kind of, you know, not to force anybody, hey, listen to my story, I want you to hear this. And you all volunteered to come into this room, right? Nobody, okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, you know, if you're uncomfortable by what I have to say, then maybe you should take a look in the mirror and see why, why that's making you uncomfortable. So before treatment, I, I gave you a little bit of a idea of what it was like, but it was difficult. It was really, really difficult. I was, afraid of absolutely everything. I was paranoid about everything, you name it. Um, I, I didn't want to be around it. Uh, I had a crippling fear of everyday things, social situations in particular, they were paralyzing. I have, well had, uh, basically the same reaction that somebody would get being chased by a bear by going into a so any kind of social situation, like whether it be school, work, uh, you know, a gathering, family thing. Uh, one, when I was in college uh, a couple years ago, well, more than a couple now, but uh, I didn't have a test, didn't have anything big that day, but I drove up to campus, sat in my car, and I could not move. I could not get out of my car. There was nothing happening. I didn't have a presentation. I didn't have any past due homework or anything like that. It's just... I, I couldn't do it, so I turned around, put my car in reverse, drove back home, and shot an email, hey, I'm not feeling good, I'm, I can't come in today. Uh, I'd also cancel plans a lot, which would lead me to feeling very, very alone, because I made myself alone. It was self-imposed isolation. I'd also find a way to be alone in crowded spaces, so I'd go sit in a corner, you know, bury my nose in, in my phone or something, and just ignore everybody. Uh, I don't so feel like people were always looking at me for any flaws whatsoever, you know. And people don't care. Most of the time, nobody cares what you're doing when you're walking around. But I, I just had it in my mind that, well, somebody's going to be looking at me if I have you know, a little spot on my shirt, if I have a booger hanging out, if I have something in my beard. Everybody's going to be paying attention to that, and they're all going to go back and tell everybody they know about me. Uh, one funny thing that I used to do when I would commute by train I got on the, I would get on the train pretty early in the route, right towards the beginning, so all, all the seats would be open. So I'd sit down, you know, put my stuff on my lap, 
leave the seat next to me open, but hope nobody would sit next to me. And then by the time we got to all of the onboarding stations and nobody was next to me, I started wondering, well, what the hell is wrong with me? Why isn't anybody sitting next to me? And, you know, do I smell funny? What is this? I, I don't feel that way anymore, partially because I don't ride the train, uh, but in the, for the most part, I, I just have gotten to a point where I don't care what other people are thinking. I was also angry. Anything can make me angry, make me very, very angry. I had a very high stress job and being on the ambulance and untreated anxiety and depression, it was not a good combination at all. And like many people in public service, at that time I was way too proud to admit that there was something wrong with me. I, uh, you know, I was the responder, I was the person giving the help, there can't be anything wrong with me. And unlike way too many people in public service, I sought treatment. And I say that because I, I know personally of at least six people in public service who have committed suicide. Uh, various ways, various reasons. I don't know what was going on in their heads, but it, it's a real thing in public service, police, fire, EMS. It, it's something that should be addressed. I was also extremely misunderstood. People would think that I was angry when I was just terrified and trying not to screw up. Apparently my deer in the headlights look also looks like my I'm gonna kill you look. When in reality I just, please leave me alone. I don't want anything to do with anybody right now. Uh, I wasn't, well yeah I was angry, but most of the, a, lot, a lot of the times it was just, especially in social situations, just please. I, I'd rather be by myself. Nothing personal, just go away. Um, but I'm no longer ashamed of who I am. Before, I wanted to hide in shame because of my conditions, but now I know that it's just part of me, and I'm not too proud to admit that I need help anymore. And when, I, when my depression was untreated, I used to have deep, deep valleys. I not get out of bed, can't function, can't do anything. And now I realize that it's just a part of me. The valleys aren't as deep anymore. I, not to say that I don't have bad days, we all have bad days, but they're much less frequent than they were before and they're not nearly as deep and I can usually overcome them and still function. My anxiety has gone down tremendously. Obviously I wouldn't be standing up here in front of a room full of people I don't know telling, hey, these are the most intimate things about me. Um, but it still happens. They, I, I still have occasional attacks. They don't last as long as they used to, but I, I have those, those moments. Since getting on medication and seeing therapists, I've become much more comfortable in social situations. Again, obviously, I'm, I'm here. This is, I don't even know how many of these I've done this year, but it's quite a few. Uh, and there aren't any, there aren't many times anymore compared to the way it used to be where I'm terrified of doing everyday things. I can walk into a grocery store without freaking out. I can, you know, have, uh, go to a family event without freaking out about who's going to be there. And I'm also not as afraid of losing my job because of being unable to focus. Uh, because, you know, that was a whole messy situation where I'd worry about losing my job because I couldn't focus which would lead me to lead me to having more anxiety and then not being able to do my job because I was freaking out about how I couldn't do my job and uh, then I'd worry about well my production sucks so they're going to fire me and just a horrible horrible spiral but I now realize that we're not alone since getting diagnosed I've realized that I'm not alone nobody with mental illness is alone and I was afraid of admitting it because of the way that people might view me. And I don't feel that way anymore because of organizations like OSME. So I kind of teased OSME a little bit earlier. They are open sourcing mental illness. It's an organization, a nonprofit based out of Lafayette, Indiana, started by Ed Finkler a few years ago. He's on all the social medias as uh, Funkatron and kind of a mission of Erasing the stigma from, of mental illness, 
in the tech community specifically doing research and providing uh, resources for employers, employees, HR professionals, and just being supportive. Uh, so it's a great organization. Uh, there, there are some links to it. It's osmihelp.org is the actual site. And just, I can't say enough nice things. They, they helped me. Ed is the one who inspired me to do this talk. Uh, he doesn't do as much talking anymore. He kind of got burnt out of it. But you know, Joe Ferguson does it. We have quite a few people doing speaking campaigns along this line. So why tech specifically? Well, there was always suspected to be a higher incidence of mental illness in the tech community, but there was no actual research done. Have any of you gone to or heard of the, the site devpressed.com? Mm -hmm. It used to be a forum uh, where developers anonymously could just get on and say, hey, listen, I'm having a really hard time. I, I, I need some help. You know, anybody got advice? Uh, Osme absorbed that, so now it's the Osme forums, and you know, when when somebody will post on there, we all get notifications. Or if somebody moderating sees that, you know, we'll get a message on Slack from one of the moderators. Like, can anybody jump in here and maybe offer some advice, maybe give some feedback to this person? Uh, but sites like that, and there were word of mouth. That was all there was to go on. But studies have shown that there's an increased incidence of mental illness specifically anxiety and depression in people with above average IQs. Now I'm not here to toot my own horn or toot everybody else's horn, but we're all in tech. It takes a certain kind of person. I'd say that we're, we're all pretty, pretty smart. Um, but it suggests that the, the studies show that intelligent people with hyper brains are more reactive to environmental stimulus that may predispose them to certain, certain psychological disorders as well as physiological conditions involving elevated sensory and altered immune and inflammatory responses. I had to read that <laughs> word for word because I cannot remember that. Boiled down, you know, very high level, people who have high IQs are more likely to suffer from mental illness of some sort and more, more likely to be reactive to, to things that might cause mental illness. Another thing Uh, is imposter syndrome. Has anybody heard of that? Yeah. If you haven't, the high level of that is, it's the feeling that you don't deserve to be doing what you're doing. Uh, I get that all the time. I have a fancy title. I don't think I deserve it. I don't know why any place would ever hire me. I don't know why any of you actually came to my talk, but I keep doing it. Um, and I'm on a pretty, pretty large Slack. It's a front-end developer Slack. Uh, that has more transitioned into a developer Slack in general. And, you know, 17,000 people on there. Uh, and not all of them are active. A lot of them are just, hey, I want to sign up for anything. But we, I, I started a mental health channel on there and just, you know, to see what would happen, see who wanted to, to go in and vent a little bit. And immediately got a few hundred people just coming in there and we were all venting to each other saying, here, these are situations I've been in. But one of the biggest, uh, recurring themes is imposter syndrome because nobody feels like they should be doing what they're doing. Everybody has it, some, and except for a certain certain type of person that I definitely am not. And it, it for me at least, it's characterized, you know, again, very high level. It's the inability to take compliments. You know, at, at whatever whatever level you want to put that at. You know, a compliment could be, "Hey, congratulations, you get this job." <laughs> Are you sure about that? Hey. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we're giving you a promotion. Uh, maybe you don't want to do that. Hey, putting some more responsibility on your plate. Ooh, about that. So, all right. I got some more questions for all of you because I've been talking for a bit. I need to take a drink, so I'm going to give you all a chance to answer. Have any of you ever taken a sick day? Have you ever told anybody with glasses or contacts, just try looking a bit harder? <laughs> As a joke or seriously? No, seriously. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Have you ever asked someone in a wheelchair if they really need the help? <laughs> How about telling somebody with heart condition or diabetes, stop taking your medicine. You don't need it. <laughs> so we all have social media of some, some form. Probably seeing images like this. This is an antidepressant and this is shit. 
<laughs> no, it's not. We're both antidepressants. <laughs> <laughs> you might see this one. You don't. I don't need pills to be happy. Well, good for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> my favorite. And I don't know if you can read in the back. You don't need <laughs> antidepressants if you lift. Um, to me, they all pretty much say the same thing: that you're not trying hard enough. You don't really need help. It's all in. It's all in your. Well, it's really. Technically, it is in your head, but no, it's all in your imagination. Let's say that. It's something you can just snap out of. You know, have you tried just being happy? But I can vouch for the effects of medication. Uh, everyone is different. What works for me might not work for somebody else. And I'm not here to shame anybody for whatever path they take to mental health. You know, if, if the forest works for you, if walking in the woods just... <laughs> if, if walking in the woods makes you happy, awesome. If, that, if the fresh air does it for you, for me, it didn't. Mindfulness techniques didn't work. Medication did. Uh, therapy did. And we also have our own memes. And if you can't read that, it says, if you can't make your own neurotransmitters, store-bought is fine. <laughs> so, going by all those questions, what if people with physical health problems were treated the way people with mental health problems are treated? Well, I found this fun little video, and that's why I was checking the sound earlier. And I was like, yeah, right, man. Oh! Oh, my head! Please don't complain. Don't ruin the vibe. It's like you're not even trying to walk. <laughs> Have you ever tried not having diarrhea? <laughs> I was killing you. Did you mention that? No! Oh my god, dude, I caught myself and it looks really, really bad! Some people have it way worse than you do. Gotta <laughs> chill out. <laughs> So I guess you're not going out this time. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh man, I really think I signed you this time. I gotta go see my physical therapist. Therapy? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever, weirdo. Can you hold on one second? Honestly, your attitude sucks. Dude, can you take another insult? Yeah, I kind of have to. Have you ever thought about dropping the pharmaceuticals? I think I'm natural. I'm like diabetes. Enough is enough. It's a beautiful day, man. It's time to get up. Dude, I just got eye surgery. Yeah, like a week ago. Well, it still hurts. Oh, I think your friend hurt himself. Oh, no. No, he's fine. <laughs> So, how do we erase the stigma around mental illness? Um, Sorry, I'm still laughing over that video. <laughs> it's, it's a good one. I, I, I do chuckle still every time I see it. Uh, but it's, it's real. I mean, you know, if you think about it that way, what if we treated people with physical illness or physical disabilities the way that people treat those of us with mental illness or mental disabilities? Just because it's not visible doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Well, so erasing the stigma we need to be stronger than fear. And how do we do that? We start the conversation. Again, you all are here. You're taking part in the conversation, so thank you. We listen. If somebody trusts you enough to talk about their mental health, just listen. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to be an active listener. Just be a venting board if that's what they need. And as somebody with mental illness, hearing an affirmation can do amazing things. Like I mentioned a couple times, I was, I was a paramedic. It's not, you know, me wearing a badge, like, ah, no, it's just, I, I, I transported a lot of patients who were in crisis, and more often than not, I was able to talk to them during, you know, the, the 10 minutes that I was with them to, you know, okay, we're back here, we're away from everybody who's causing you issues, or, or making you more upset because they don't know how to deal with it, and they were yelling at you, now tell me what's really going on. Why do you really feel like this? And just letting them talk for a while. And there were more than one occasion where I would drop somebody off in the emergency room that, hey, can I give you a hug? Really, I, 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 I feel so much better just venting. And it was, you know, okay, fine, yeah, if, if that helps you out. And, you know, it, it was good for my transport because then, you know, taking somebody down from combative to getting a chance to breathe because nobody was listening to them and for the emergency room receiving because now this 
potentially combative patient is going to be a little bit more cooperative because they feel like somebody might actually care about what they're going through. And don't be ashamed though. If you have mental illness, just remember you're not damaged, you have a disease. Also, try to be respectful. You can't always tell who has a disability. So try to be respectful of what you say or how you portray diseases. And something that I I thought about bringing up in these talks before, but I never had until I did one very similar to this for a, a remote talk with Marketo. The woman who went before me talked about her OCD, and she talked about at, at great lengths, you know, not going into what her compulsions actually are, but you know how how offensive it is to her when somebody who likes to be organized or who likes to, you know, not have a mess on their table says, "Oh, I'm so OCD about this." Well, no, really. She feels like she's going to die if she does not do what she has to. Her compulsions are driving her to the point where she feels that either her or people she cares about will actually be harmed if she does not do whatever her compulsion is. So, so just, just watch what you're saying and think about what you're saying before you, you say it. And if you do feel that you have a disease, please get treatment. Go see a doctor, see a therapist, see, see somebody. Now. We are at a conference. Most of you, or, or some of you, may have convinced your, your employers to let you come here, so let's make it worth their while. Um, what about the workplace? My anecdotes are one thing, but how are employees and uh, employers affected? Well, <clears throat> let's see what data says. Like I said, uh, up until a few years ago, there was no actual tech-specific data done, but OSME does surveys yearly. I would really love it if all of you took 20 minutes out of your day at some point to go to osmehelp.org slash research and fill out that survey. Um, last year's had about 800 responses. Uh, the survey was made available to several different communities and all these responses are self-reported. So would you bring up a physical health issue with a potential employer at an interview? Survey says yes, 23%, no, 37%. So, pretty even there overall, not too bad. But would you bring up a mental health issue with a potential employer at an interview? Only 5% said yes, overwhelmingly no. And not saying that you should be necessarily, yeah. Does the ADA cover mental health accommodations? Yes, yes, because it is considered a disability. Um, so, as you can see, almost twice as many said no. Uh, another question: Does your provider employed re does your employer provide resources to learn more about mental health and how to seek help? This doesn't include mental or insurance. It's more: Do they have an employee assistance plan or anything like that? It's pretty evenly spread. I don't know. Yes, no. Um, I, I'd like to see the no slice a little bit smaller, if not a lot smaller, and the yes slice much, much bigger, but you know, only 30, only 29% say that, with any certainty that they know there are resources. Does your employer provide mental health benefits as part of health care coverage? Well, I think that they have to now, thanks to the, the ACA. Um, but only 56% people can actually say yes they do. Now this next one came from the 2016 survey for some reason uh, it was left off of the 2017 I think it's a very important question uh, especially since the survey is anonymous. Do you feel that being identified as a person with mental health issues would hurt your career? That tiny little sliver uh, of red is no it has not and blue is no I don't think it would. But seven and it's even too small for me. Thirty-nine percent are saying yes, it has. Yes, I think it would. So overwhelmingly, it's towards the positive, even with the maybe in there. Um, this is something I worry about every time I give this talk. Every time, because you know, in this field, not everybody stays around at the same place forever. But it's really freeing if somebody Google's my name. They'll probably find one of several of these YouTube videos or one of my sessions submitted to a various camp. 
and they'll watch it and all my cards will be out there on the table. They'll know everything they need to know about me and if they hire me afterwards, awesome for them. And if they don't, they don't deserve me. Um, this one also from 2016. Do you think discussing a health issue with your employer would have negative consequences? We separated this into mental and physical. Just for contrast, if you mention it, only 4% uh, in physical said yes. No, five times more said that it would definitely be negative consequences, not even counting the maybes on mental. So, Oh, and that's that's because of the stigma associated with mental illness. You know, if I mention it, people are going to think different of me. Yeah. I just want to compare those two questions. Yeah. The, uh, the one before this. And the... Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Now here's one from 2017, the last survey. Have you been diagnosed with a mental health condition? Now, I, I do like to preface this with, this is self-reported. The, the US average is around 20%, and this is from 800 responses. But have you been diagnosed? 42% in the tech community who, who answered. So that's a pretty significant increase. That's you know double the percentage from just the general population. So for us, twice as many people. Now this next one includes um, the actual diagnosed. So do you think you have a mental health condition? So the 43% the here is the diagnosed percentage. Sorry. Possibly 19, don't know 9. So it, even if we add on the possibly, I mean that's potentially 60%. Three out of every five of us potentially, or think that we have, or have been diagnosed. Now, these charts lead me to one thing, and that's that, in general, we are afraid to talk about mental illness. Whether it be in the workplace, whether it be in personal lives, but why are we afraid? We're afraid because of the stigma around it. We're afraid that being honest will have negative consequences. Um, we're afraid coworkers will change their opinions. And if you have anxiety, worrying what other people think can just tear at you and eat at you. Um, some of our minds go straight to the worst case scenario. I know that I tend to have a very binary mind where if it's not good, it's horrible. And if something happens, I immediately go, you know, the glass isn't half full, the glass is going to shatter and I'm going to cut myself on it. That's, that's how <laughs> I look at life. <laughs> yeah. Um, I... At one job, I got a, an email the weekend before my 90-day probation was up. I got an email on the Friday leading into the weekend saying we need to talk from my boss. So the entire weekend, I was polishing up my resume, getting ready to send it out on Indeed. Just like, oh, crap, they're, they're going to get rid of me. And on day 90, we had the call. And like, hey, man, just want to check in, see how everything's going, making sure you got what you need. And, you know, I, that I, I was just worried for no reason. But... That's just the way that I am. Uh, I also one time thought I was getting Milton. If you've ever seen Office Space, uh, tried to log into my email and the password was incorrect. So I just thought that maybe they're letting me do the work until I figure out that I'm not getting paid anymore. And <laughs> so, you know, hey, I've got a problem or is there something we need to talk about? We're also afraid that we might get sent to the HR department. So I, <laughs> I had... Uh, a situation where I needed a couple days off. I, I was just in no good shape to do my work and I didn't want to lie on my time card. I didn't want to you know, say I'm doing stuff. I didn't want to build the client for stuff that I'm not doing. So I called up my direct manager, somebody that I dealt with every day. And I said, listen, I, I need to breathe. I need a couple days off. Um, here's why. I, I have depression, I have anxiety, and I am waiting to get into a doctor to get medication. I am not, I am not well. And it was basically an immediate, like, okay, yeah, take a couple days off. We'll talk to you later. And hang up. Five minutes later, I get a call from HR. Hey, we hear that you have an issue we need to talk about, and what are we going to do? And through no fault of their own, I know that they have a very hard job. I, I really understand that they're not put in the best positions. But 
I don't know about you, but I don't deal with HR on a regular basis. I, I don't know them by name. I don't know their faces. I don't recognize their voices. But from all the courage that it took me to build up to tell my direct boss, somebody that I work with daily and spoke with daily, to have to hang up and now tell all this stuff to a complete stranger, you know, that, that isn't the best way to handle it. Can I just, as an attorney, just say that they could have been concerned about FMLA issues, right, ADA right. issues, and your immediate manager is not supposed to be dealing with those. Right. You're supposed to put a wall up. So Definitely. And I, I'm I can, just saying, depending on how big an organization Yeah, I can completely appreciate that. And I, I, I understand that it's something that companies need to, to really work on in general. Um, but we have handbooks for that, and I'll get to that later. <laughs> uh, so... As of 2015, you know, roughly 20%, 17.9% of all U.S. adults had some form of mental illness, right? So going with that figure, we're not even talking about just tech anymore. Why should a workplace care? Because depression alone, just depression, you know, this big of a slice of that book, this tall, impacts 9.5% of the American adult population. How much? 9.5%. And it's estimated to cause... 200 million lost work days each year, which costs employers up to $44 billion annually. So how can we mitigate this? Well, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. If a workplace is prepared and educated to deal with this particular disability, then an employee may feel more comfortable being open about it if they need time off. From, from my experience, and I don't know anybody else's experiences, so a lot of this unfortunately is anecdotal, but before I was able to build up the courage to say, hey, I need the time off, I spent a couple days not doing anything, but still putting on my, my time card. Yeah, I did this, sure, I did something here. Um, and so though that's, that's lost work hours. That's, that somebody's paying for that for work that wasn't done. But if I felt more comfortable talking to my boss about it, or if I knew that they had the open policy about it, and I could have just walked in and said, hey, I've got this issue, I could have taken one day off, eight lost work hours instead of you know, the, the couple days that I didn't do anything and the two days that I needed to take off afterwards. Because I'd have times where I'd show up and do nothing for days, but I was afraid of going to my boss. If, if I had felt comfortable saying I need an afternoon, could have recharged. I could have just got it done. I could have breathed, gone down to the lake or something, and you know, because this incident in particular happened before I got medication, which you is walked in the forest. Uh, hmm? You could have walked in the forest. Yeah, I could have just walked through the forest and been cured. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and that's that's a whole other situation where I was diagnosed, but. At least, I'm from Indiana, and in Indiana, psychologists are not allowed to prescribe any medications. You have to get it prescribed by either, or, yeah, psychologists cannot prescribe. Psychiatrists are MDs. They can prescribe, or you can be seen by your primary care physician. And like most people, well, like way too many, I don't want to say most, but like way too many people in my age group at the time of this whole thing happening, I did not have a primary care provider. So it took me three months to get into one who then set me to a different psychologist that was affiliated with them to say, okay, yeah, he really does need these medications. So I was, you know, hey, I've got a problem, but I can't do anything about it until somebody else sees me. Imagine if you, if you went in for a toothache, you knew that you had a toothache and somebody told you, hey, yeah, definitely, that thing's falling out, you're, you're, you're not good, and you're just in pain, and you had to wait three months before you could even get a medication, it's something, see somebody to, to help you take care of that. That's kind of the same situation. Well, how else can we help? Like I mentioned before, I'm going to mention this many times, take the OSME 2018 survey because the more data we have, the more we know where to pool our resources. We could fight ignorance with information and that, that position that I had where I ran into problems with HR, I, I sent, a, on, during my exit interview, I said, hey, check out this organization, because um, it might help. And there is also something called mental health first aid. 
which is a class that's available, I think, that anybody in management, in HR, anything, all, you know, any supervisory position should have that class available to them, should take it, should know how to handle or recognize signs of a crisis. Um, we could take the OSME survey, osmehelp.org slash research. Um, it takes about 20 minutes. It's great help for us and it helps us show where to pull our resources. And like I mentioned before, we have handbooks. Osme has handbooks. Uh, I'm not trying to sell anything. Well, I guess I am, but I'm not pushing sales because I don't see a cut from it aside from what goes back to Osme. But they're DRM free, they're digital, they're on LeanPub, and we get, I think they're $10, <coughs> well, $9.99, and Osme sees $8 of that back. The other cut goes to LeanPub. But the three that we have are mental health and tech guidelines for mental wellness in the workplace, guidelines for executives and HR professionals, and guidelines for employees. And these are all based on the ADA. These are all um, reviewed by attorneys that we have um, helping us out, volunteering for OSME. Uh, so, and they're updated frequently. I mean, most of us work in tech at OSME. So uh, we go through the full iterative process and we have, you know, our, the handbooks have version control and it, it's really, really, really good and really beneficial. And seriously, please take the survey. <laughs> Every response helps us out. Now we're fortunate because we are in an awesome community and community is our greatest resource. <coughs> Excuse me. We look at the survey again, 43% responded that they have a mental illness diagnosis. That's a huge number. And then the additional 20% on the I might have one. I mean, three out of six of us, or three out of five, that's a lot. So what does that mean? It means we're not alone. And fortunately, we're more than usernames, even though we may call each other by our usernames. Um, but events like this help remind us that we're people. We're not just, you know, somebody in the issue queue. We're not ones and zeros. We're, we're here. We're interacting. We're, you know, checking out sessions, sharing information, talking to each other, helping each other. And most importantly, we're not damaged. And with a little work together, we can erase the stigma. So there are a few resources available that I like to put on the back here. Osmehelp.org for anything Osme related. If you need a therapist, 1-800-THERAPIST or psychologytoday.com has a therapist finder, um, which is great. You can narrow down by specialty, by location, by insurance. And psychologytoday.com, last I checked, was a Drupal site, so cool. get back to them. Uh, National Association on Mental Illness, you know, uh, great organization, and Suicide Lifeline. If you know anybody or if you yourself are in crisis and you don't want to call 911, you don't want that happening. I recommend you call 911, you get all the help you need. But if not, call call this number. And thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you have the time, another survey. I have my own Google Form survey just to see you know, how, how I can make this talk better. So please take it, tell me what you liked, what you hated, and before before you put your hands together, <laughs> anybody have any questions? Yes. I just wanted to make a comment. As someone with bipolar disorder and Asperger's and a spear of steps and slopes, this was incredible. I just wanted to ask you where to find Drupal jobs, like jobs.drupal.org, because I'm currently self employed I've been doing freelance work, and I, like even if I can get through the door and get over these stigmas, I'm wondering how to start looking for Drupal work in like a company more than freelance. Uh, Maybe remote. But. That, that's a whole other <laughs> talk. Um, <laughs> <I know. laughs> Indeed was great for me. Drupal.org was great. I found uh, a position on Stack Overflow careers and then cool. just hanging out at the meetups. And cool. uh, if you go to meetups, if you go to events, I know for some like people I've it's been difficult. I've desperately looking you know, for remote like telecommute site building work. Yeah. Back in development. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I, that, that's what's worked for me, and word of mouth, and just just being around if you can. Cool, but, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? How long have you been giving this time? Uh, about a year and a half now. And it, it's changed significantly over <laughs> that time. Yeah. I um, 
actually have a close family member who took his own life. Um, I'm sorry. From about a year into it. But um, one of the things that I found very frustrating was the number of people who felt that they could give a diagnosis or helpful, what if you did this? And yeah. He had anxiety disorder and, you know, yoga and the whole thing. So one of the questions I have now is whether being in a remote employment situation is preferable because you don't have all the stimulus of the social anxiety and so forth, or whether it's a negative because of the isolation. For me? I'm just trying to understand for myself, like it, as a person who experiences that fear of walking into you know, the office every day, is there still a benefit of being engaged with people, or is it better to be remote and sort of, you know, like you said, username, there's a little bit of a barrier? Yeah. For me, I, I, I can't answer for anybody else because that's, that everybody is different. Everybody has different experiences. I found that when I was fully remote, especially with a company that didn't fully embrace the remote culture, even though, you know, 75% of us were remote, we'd still get the emails like, hey, there's lunch in the, in the, front room for you, or hey, let's all have donuts, hey, we're going to happy hour. So that felt very alienating to me. But on the other hand, when I was in an office, I would you know, isolate myself completely, put on my headphones, close off anything I could around me, and not be seen by people just by design. I think that for me personally, a good mix is I work remotely for three to four days a week and I go into the office the other two just so that I can be around people but again everybody is different so whatever works for you I don't think that being isolated is good unless you really need to but if it works for you and if that's the only way you can function then I think that you had a question right yeah, I, I know it's not a mental health condition but Morgan brought up Asperger's syndrome so is there any um, organization that might be looking into like what happens in the tech community with Asperger's syndrome and, and becoming you know employable. Um, okay, I can definitely mention that at Osme and see if if we might be able to add some of those some of that into our research or see if anybody knows of any organizations similar to Osme that is doing research in that. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you want to give me contact information, I can definitely email you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you know regardless of what outcome I find. Thank you. We have a few more questions. Okay. If somebody else wants to jump in. Um, <laughs> do you, how long have you been working working there? And do you have like other people that you work with, like in the same office that you you talk about, talk to for support and that kind of stuff that have come out? Um and been more open about their mental health issues or is this something kind of like your own crusade still even though it's gotten better and I, I'm still relatively new at Genuine because uh, there have been some, some employers that just wasn't a culture match or for, for various reasons I I didn't stick around you know, one, when I was there it was a great company, it was great culture but the client I was hired for specifically was dragging their feet so I sat around for three months doing pretty much nothing and I just got bored out of my mind. And <clears throat> so you know, when when I put in my resignation there, the HR department was like, well, it took you long enough. We were <laughs> really trying to find you something to do, but it just wasn't happening. Uh, so that I left on good terms, but there, there were some that just didn't really know how to adapt to the way, it was a combination of adapting to how I work and me adapting to how they work and it just wasn't working. But where I am now, uh, I I feel very comfortable with with talking about things, and other people aren't necessarily as open about it. But I I'm fairly confident that everybody has seen a video of this talk, uh, and they know, and nobody's treated me any differently. That's and great. you know, it's a smaller my the office I work out of in Chicago. We have four employees out of the you know. 150 that genuine has in, in total. So we're we're pretty tight knit, and you know, we're we're very very close. We all sit you know, in one corner of one floor of a building that we share with other companies that are under our same umbrella. 
Um, and, and what kind of development do you do? Do you think kind of the, just like you said, depending on the type of mental health illness, it kind of depends on your coping mechanisms. Do you think it changes on the type of job that you have as well? Like, do you do front end or back end? Or? I do mostly back end. I mean, my uh, my title is architect, but I do a lot of the the back end development as well on projects uh, on PHP. But I can I like to dabble in the front end when okay. the opportunity arises. Uh, for me, as far as a coping mechanism, I think that learning something new really helps me in okay. accomplishing something. I, I built a, an app that now comes the shameless plug that for Drupal Jeopardy. It's a React-based app that uses Drupal as a back end, and it is uh, React on the front end with Node and WebSockets that you can play an entire round of Jeopardy. The reason I'm not demoing it is because I am not smart enough to fill out 66 clues of Drupal Jeopardy <laughs> clues. So if you would like to submit clues to Drupal Jeopardy, dorfs.website has instructions, and I have, an, uh, I have a project on drupal.org where I can give people credit for <laughs> submitting clues or helping out or even clue grooming. So that, that's, that was a pet project. I had some downtime, and I decided I'm going to learn React. Uh, but yeah, learning new stuff and finding new challenges really it's like really I learned the guitar. You said you played the Barry sax? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm just curious, uh, Anna Kills, uh, how you started off getting this presentation and getting to the point. Was that a big uh, stressful experience for you to like, get into that? Like, how did that, oh, yeah. did that help in your uh, practice? So this is... it. As odd as it sounds, this is actually very therapeutic for me, because if any of you walk out of here, you know, starting the conversation with somebody else, then I've done what I need to do. But the way I got started in it was Ed Finkler gave a very similar talk to this at a PHP meetup in Chicago that I went to, and uh, it was it was at the same time that I was in that in-between period where I was diagnosed, I knew what I had, but I didn't have medication, I didn't have the proper treatment aside from going to a therapist. But therapy did help a lot. I just need that little extra boost of uh, serotonin to, to make sure that, you know, to keep me kind of level. Um, so I I wanted to do talks at conferences, at camps for quite a while. I wanted to share my expertise on something. I love teaching. I love doing stuff along these lines, which I know is hugely contradictory to everything. I just told you about the way I was before treatment, but I do enjoy this kind of thing. And if... Uh, the way that this happened, I reached out to Ed by email, because this was before I was affiliated with Osmi, and said, hey, I was thinking about maybe doing a talk similar to yours and telling my experiences. And his response was, you know what, you take my presentation, you change the names. Hell, you don't even have to change the names. You just take my presentation, you read it if you want to. I'm like, well, <laughs> I don't know if that's going to work, but I grew a beard, started wearing glasses, and uh, then, <laughs> look, if you ever see a picture of him, he... he He's a tall guy with beard and glasses, but that describes a lot of people <laughs> in development as well. Uh, but uh, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, come on, uh, join the Asmi Slack. We'll we'll get you ramped up on this. We'll and then you know, the other people who are doing the talks, we all kind of celebrate our victories of hey, I got accepted to this. Hey, I got accepted to this, and then we all you know, mourn together. Hey, I got rejected from this one. Bunch of jerks. And, uh, <laughs> I'd like to join this. <laughs> but it was it was a great. They, they were extremely supportive. They helped me groom this talk. And you know, I, <laughs> I, I went to PHP Detroit, and Joe Ferguson, who's kind of um, taking the reins while Ed's uh, recovering from burnout, he, he also got accepted at PHP Detroit. And our talks are also very, very similar to Ed's because his was just so damn inspiring that it was hard not to, to incorporate. And it's all of us telling our stories, but... I somebody went to Joe's talk, which was before mine, and then went to my talk. And in at my survey at the end, he put, you know, it was very similar to the one I saw yesterday. But you know, it's it's a good topic. People should be talking about it. Yeah. Anybody else? I think we've got about thirty seconds before. Just anecdotally, sometimes someone who gets into that kind of depression can't actually even call their employer. Yeah. Oh, I believe me. I know. My mania faded, and I had it earlier this year. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing is just how much you, 
you know, we always question about whether we should even let some an employer know right. about mental illness or Asperger's. I had a trouble with, I worked for Renfin for a while and I didn't want to tell them I had Asperger's. It was so with that, and you said you're an attorney? Yes. Or, okay. She's uh, my mom. So, so please, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you don't necessarily have to say what disability you have. If you call up your HR department and you just say, I have a disability, the only things, and please correct me because if I'm ignorant to this, I do not want to be giving bad advice. The only thing that HR can say is what reasonable accommodations can we make? You don't have to tell them what it is, but you know, for me, it's, it's out there. Everybody knows what I have. Nope. I, made, I made a film, do a film with my computer science professor on my Asperger's. So I think everyone's going to know too. It's on Google, you know. Okay. Hey, whatever works for you. I mean, that's 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 awesome. That I would like to. You know. I'll get you. I'll get you the name of the film after the session. Cause okay. I wanted yeah. to get your contact info too, if that's cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Please. Okay. Well, it is twelve thirty-one by my clock. That one's a couple minutes fast. So. Lunchtime. Okay. okay.